The 10 minute university program is a program of Clackamas County Master Gardeners offered in collaboration with and in support of the OSU Extension Service Master Gardener program. We are going to talk about a lot of ideas today. If you're interested in learning more about related topics, here are four OSU publications that will offer much more in-depth information. In contrast, the 10 Minute University handouts and videos provide you a shortcut to research-based information. Our handouts are typically one sheet of paper and our videos range from five minutes to an hour. I hope you will check out all these free resources. Our session today is recorded and uh, you will receive a recording link and lots of resources in a day or two. And if you don't see it in the email box, please check spam folder and uh, other folders because sometimes our email land there. I have three objectives for today. The first one is you will take away 10 ideas for enhancing the garden to benefit pollinators. And the second one is I wanna introduce you to OSU garden design resources and uh, give you some ideas on how to make adjustments to the comprehensive design in order to suit your space and interest. And finally, I hope you will answer to a call for action which will make our gardens more sustainable. The presentation, the publication that is the one that contains detailed design information. So if you don't look at anything else, but only have time for one, this is the one you wanna check out for sure. And it, it is uh, available for free download. So let's start it with the 10 proven tips. Number one, leave some soil bare. I know that sounds a bit strange because we're gardeners and we're into planting. But the fact is 70% of the bees nest underground. And bees certainly use bare areas in the garden if they are left alone and not disturbed. Different species of bees have different digging abilities. Uh, some can use the sandy soil better and others do have the ability to dig into clay-based soil. The important thing for us gardeners, if we want to leave a bare area in the garden for bees is to not use organic mulch in that area. This is because Native bees simply don't have the ability to dig through a layer of mulch. If you don't like to just look at bare soil, you could put in some decorative rocks or pebbles, uh, as is shown in the lower right photo. I often have people ask, what kind of bees will tunnel underground and what kind of substrate do they like vote, uh, best? Unfortunately, this is an area of uh, study where research information is just very lacking. So all I can say is if you leave a section of the garden that's not well attended and um, don't disturb it, and ideally it has uh, good sun, sunlight exposure, because that's better, easier for visual orientation by bees, they will use it. Number two, add one clump of pollinator plant. The key thing here is if you only have space for one kind of plant, 
uh, instead, uh, what we want is to have a large enough clump. Experts have uh, researched this topic of how big a clump will make it great as visual targeting and also for energy efficient foraging. And they found a three foot diameter is what we want to aim for. The three foot diameter size works well for bees and butterflies, but for hummingbirds, it's best to not keep, uh, not to have food plants too close together because they're territorial. And that way you can lessen the competition. You're gonna see again and again where I show examples of good plant candidates. These four categories, native, low maintenance, non-native, and hot and dry. And these four correspond with four different designs available from Oregon State. Uh, the publication is listed on the bottom of the page. I will go back to that topic and talk more about it. But for now, when we look at the plants, I just want to show there are many candidates if you like native plants. And if you want something that's low maintenance, lots of ideas and possibilities, and equally for a hotter and drier environment, for example, Central Oregon or Southern Oregon, as opposed to the Willamette Valley, there are many choices. And let's take a look at some of them. Goldenrod and Douglas Aster are two of the plants that the Oregon State Garden Ecology Lab conducted extensive study and found to be highly attractive to native bees. Balsam root and Rocky Mountain bee plant are two great candidates if you have hotter and drier sites. And here are many other possibilities. When you look at the array of colors and shapes of the flower, and in addition, some of the plants are taller, like Cosmos, there are taller varieties. Mexican sunflower is easily three, four feet uh, high. And sneezeweed, the different cultivated varieties come in different heights. There is a huge um, selection that will probably fit different gardening needs. I like to grow borage and calendula in my uh, vegetable garden plot. And I also led the borage to go to seed, which basically assures a, a continuing supply of these plants once you get started. And because they're pretty easy to pull out where you don't want them, uh, that's a really easy way to provide food for pollinators for a long season. I tend to notice a lot of bumblebees on the borage. And of course, alyssum is a plant that's known to attract a wide variety of uh, pollinators and really good to have in the garden if you want to attract natural enemies of um, potential pests. The third idea is to grow a variety of flowers. And here the operative word is bloom time. We want a variety of flowers in order to provide a very long season of bloom. And um, this is because we know native bees emerge at different times of the year from early spring to late summer. At each species, tend to live only a couple weeks to a couple months, but the different species come and go. And because we are not sophisticated enough to grow specific plants to attract specific type of bees, if we have a long season of bloom, we are more likely to serve a diverse variety of native bees. In addition, we know late summer food supply is critical to bumblebee colonies producing a new queen. And that's the key to having the bumblebee colony continue next season. If they don't have enough food, there will be no new queen emerging 
and that colony dies at the end of the season. The UC Berkeley Bee Lab had done quite a bit of research into uh, bee gardens or pollinator gardens. And they recommend that we have a minimum of 15 to 20 plant species in a garden, which they think is uh, a good starting point in having a variety of pollinators using them. Again, you're going to see the four categories, native, low maintenance, non-native and hot and dry habitats, and many ideas of plants for each environment. Let's take a look at some of them. So from the low maintenance garden, the OSU uh, design use these plants. So you can see the possibilities in putting together hot color combinations and also kind of a monochromatic cool color combinations depending on your preference. The plan that I want to point out is lambshear. It used to be considered a nice plant to having a garden for children to interact with because it's so soft to pet. But I learned the wool carter bee female will comb this plant for the fuzz and use it to line her nesting materials. And now I have patches of lamb's ear in my garden. And every time I walk by, I stop and look to see if I can spot a female wool carter bee. And this gives so much more enjoyment just going around the garden and looking at plants. Now, if you have a hot and dry area like uh, in Southern and Central Oregon or a microclimate in the valley that is similar, here is a list of plants that's shown from early flowering to the late flowering period. So the Oregon checker mallow is the first will flower in um, early to mid spring. And the black eye Susan and the green rabbit brush flower in late summer. Again, even for hot and dry, uh, the environment that we tend to think is less uh, easy to garden, there are lots of possibilities. And uh, one thing to keep in mind is, even though these plants are really tough, if you give them some water, and ideally it's uh, infrequent but deep, they're going to flower longer and flower better. And if you're short of space, but you have plenty of time, another possibility is to use containers to extend the season of bloom. And in this instance, this container arrangement is made with one kind of plant in one pot, lots of individual pots arranged using oh, blocks and bricks and other things to achieve a more dramatic uh, variation in heights and color combination. And of course, when you grow in containers, you can always switch out the plants when they're past their prime and bring in new ones. All right, let's go on to the fourth idea, choose simpler flowers. And by this, I mean more petals often come at the expense of pollen production. When you look at this pair of images, the flower on the left have fewer petals and therefore producing more pollen and nectar to benefit pollinators. The flower on the right, those more petals not only create a physical barrier to pollinator access to the flower, but also they made the center where the nectar and pollen production is a much smaller, um, much smaller area and have much less uh, capacity. So if you're growing flowers to benefit pollinators, then you want to choose the simpler flowers. Number five, plant natives. 
there are many uh, research projects that have shown native bees prefer native plants. And the most recent study is out of Oregon State, Oregon State University's um, uh, Garden Ecology Lab. And University of California's Urban Bee Lab has also uh, generated quite a bit of information on this topic. If you want to check out what the OSU Garden Ecology Lab has done, there is a link on the page for you to read all about it. So in general, if we're talking about having lots of flowers to benefit pollinators and spaces available, obviously a tree or a shrub is going to produce more in quantity and therefore greater benefit. But not all of us have the space. And also you may not be ready to commit to something. So if you wanna give it a try, you might consider doing some annuals and because they can plant that they can be planted from seeds or uh, small starts. So here are some native annual candidates. I've listed a bunch of flowers and I'll show you what they look like. So from the top, Farewell to, farewell to Spring, Douglas Meadow Foam and uh, California Poppy on the bottom and Globe Gilia and Facilia heterophylla. These are all plants that are part of the OSU um, plant study and have been proven to be highly attractive to native bees. The one caveat is if you use Douglas meadow foam, which is really beautiful when they're in bloom, just carpet a whole area, uh, and they're very low, so they just barely cover the ground, uh, maybe maybe what, four to six inches above ground. Just keep in mind that they can self-sow really aggressively. And um, so keep that in mind if you don't want to have Douglas meadow foam mixed in with all sorts of other plants. Number six, feed hummingbirds with plants. We know hummingbirds are the most prominent bird pollinator in North America because they have long beaks and tongue that can reach very deep into the flowers. And the physical act of feeding transfer pollen through their beak and feather. And in this page, there are a number of plants that are good hummingbird plants because they have that tubular shape flower. But there are many more possibilities. And in fact, OSU has a publication on how to attract hummingbirds to your garden. And it provides a much longer comprehensive uh, plant list than what's shown here. But in general, we know hummingbirds like trumpet-shaped flower that's rich in nectar and a bright color. So red, orange, pink are their favorite. If you want to attract hummingbird and feed them with plants, consider um, putting your flowers close to large trees and shrubs. So ideally those trees and shrubs will provide a shelter for the hummingbirds and, um, and the flowers nearby would allow them to forage and then go back into the tree and shrub uh, to rest. And this will keep the hummingbirds in your garden much longer. Number seven, use hummingbird feeders. Now you might think, why use feeders if we already have plants to feed them? Well, two reasons. The first one is research has shown that even when there are lots of flowers, hummingbirds do use feeders to supplement the natural nectar that they can find. And the second reason is during the season when flowers are not abundant, and this is when temperatures drop and we don't have as many flowering plants, feeders are the reason why anise hummingbirds have been able to expand their winter range. If you look at the map on the right, in the late 80s, 
Anna's hummingbird wintered only in California South. But after decades of people feeding them, now Anna's winter range have expanded through Oregon, Washington, and into British Columbia. And this is a finding of Project Feeder Watch, and I've included a link for you to uh, read more about it. And uh, Project Feeder Watch is a collaborative effort between Cornell University and uh, other nonprofit um, partners. And if you choose to feed hummingbirds, the best practices according to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology include a number of things. The first one is on nectar, use only sugar, not honey. And follow the specific formula, quarter cup of sugar per cup of water when it's hot and dry. And when it's uh, cooler, and less flower resources, you use a third cup of sugar per cup of water. And no dye in the solution, but use a feeder that has the red color. And they recommend a small feeder is better than a larger one. So you change the, uh, the, the nectar often, and that helps to keep it clean. And it's critical to clean the feeder carefully between each fill. And finally, on placement, again, we remember hummingbirds are territorial. So smaller ones placing different parts uh, of the garden is better because it lessens competition. Idea eight, plant a butterfly host. I think most of us think about what flowers do butterflies like in order to attract them into our garden. And often we tend to forget the rest of the life cycle. In order for an adult butterfly to complete its life cycle and produce youngs for next year, it needs a host plant. The host plant is where eggs are laid and the caterpillars feed when they hatch. So if you want to think about maybe attracting butterflies by providing a host plant, there's a separate OSU publication that provides quite a bit of information about butterfly species that visit Oregon, of which there are more than 20. And uh, for each one, they show you the host plants and the nectar plants. For me, I don't have, I don't have the space to plant big leaf maple, cottonwood, willow, these big trees uh, in my garden. But I do have the nectar plants, verbena and phlox, which the uh, tiger swallowtail like. In addition, in my neighborhood, or, or pretty close to my house, maybe a couple hundred feet, uh, are some big leaf maple and cottonwood. So I planted the verbena and phlox in the garden, and sure enough, I've been seeing western tiger swallowtail come to visit. So there are a lot of ways to think about using what's available in adjacent properties if you don't have the room, you don't have to do it all. Now, you might be wondering about what about the monarch butterflies? Uh, you may know there are two main populations of monarchs in the United States. There's the Eastern population that is much larger in size. And um, it is the one that is responsible for those huge numbers of butterfly win overwintering in the mountains of Mexico um, that we've seen in the news and seen lots of pictures. But there is a Western monarch population. And um, the Western population is much smaller and has gone through quite a bit of very drastic decline. The image on the upper right shows the monarch population trend of the Western population. 
Um, but not all is lost. The most recent census done last winter showed that there was a, a quite an increase in the number of monarch butterflies in their wintering ground, which is in coastal California. So if you want to help monarch butterflies, you want to plant milkweed, which is their host plant. And you can also join the citizen science project, which tracks the presence of milkweed and monarch sightings. And finally, don't buy into the idea of buying chrysalis of butterfly to hatch and release, because for monarchs at least, that there has been problems with pathogen coming from these hatched um, populations and transmitted to affect the wild populations. And if you plant milkweed, there are specific species that's, that's the best for um, various parts of Oregon. So if you are in the, the Willamette Valley, the two species you should plant are the showy milkweed, which is the species speciosa, and the narrow leaf milkweed, which is the species fascicularis. And if you're in Southern Oregon, Central Oregon, then there are other species of milkweed that is the best match for your area. All right, so idea number nine is plant a shrub. We were just talking about how shrubs uh, can serve as host plants for butterfly and caterpillar. And we know also many shrubs and trees also have flowers that can feed bees and birds and provide other wildlife values. So here are some good examples of uh, native shrubs, Indian plum, red flowering currant, evergreen huckleberry, and Western serviceberry. You can see all of them do at least triple duty in serving pollinators and Indian plum has quadruple duty. And so the little icons indicate hummingbird, uh, bee, caterpillar feeding, indicating a host plant, or butterfly um, nectar. No shortage of choices for, uh, th these plants will do well in west of the Cascades. And if you go to a hotter and drier area like Central Oregon or Southern Oregon, additional candidates are ocean spray, green leaf, manzanita, and California lilac. And I should say ocean spray also grows in the valley quite well. And for manzanita, the green leaf variety grows well in a hotter and drier area, but there are plenty of other manzanitas that will do well in the valley and that's the same with the California lilac or Ceanothus. So when you see a design that specified a plant for a certain region, there may be, well, first of all, that plant may be um, resilient enough that it will do in other kinds of habitat. And secondly, for that genus, for that group, there may be related plants that will do well in a slightly different habitat. So do a little exploring. And the website that's shown on the page, the OSU Landscape Plants website is a treasure trove of information. When I want to see pictures of a tree or a shrub that is not familiar, I generally will go to that website first. The beauty of that website is they not only show you an image of the plant, let's say the whole plant, or in bloom, they will show you detailed images of parts of it, like what does the leaf look like? What does the flower look like? What about the bark? What about the winter shape? What about the spring foliage? And I really like having all of that resources available at my fingertip. And the final idea, Number 10, plant a tree. We've talked about how trees can provide so much benefit. 
And the, in the publication, the main source publication, there are uh, 30 examples and about half of them are native. And uh, I did notice majority of them bloom in the spring, as we know. So it's kind of rare to get a tree that blooms outside of spring. And notice the, the name of the tree on the bottom of your page just says linden. Okay, we'll come back to this one. This is a, uh, a tree that flowers in the summer. So that makes it nice. Okay, first some spring flowering trees, cascara, vine maple, western redbud, all good native trees and uh, wonderful wildlife value and pollinator values. But some of the trees are, and shrubs can be problem prone. So in this publication, they uh, share a list and they recommend that you avoid using these problem prone plants because that will reduce the need for intervention, more work, and perhaps the use of pesticides. So coming back to that last line, Telia or linden tree. All right, so this is a summer flowering tree and it looks gorgeous when it's, when it's um, free of flowers, feeding lots of pollinators. The problem is it's prone to aphids and thrips. So as these sucking insects attack the plant, they secrete something that is sticky and it's called honeydew. So these trees were used in a shopping center parking lot in Wilsonville. And as a result, the trees had to be sprayed. And the landscape company contracted to do the spray did it during bright daylight when bees were actively feeding. And this resulted in an estimated kill of about 50,000 bumblebees. So right plant, right place. A linden tree may look gorgeous in the corner of a yard where you don't care about the honeydew. And then it can have a lot of pollinator benefit, but in the wrong place, big problem. So these are the 10 proven ideas. Leave some garden bare for soil nesting bees. Add one clump of pollinator plants because a three foot diameter is going to make it easy for them to find and also energy efficient forage. Grow a variety of plants so we can have from early spring into late fall and benefiting many, many kinds of native bees. Choose simpler flowers because the complex flowers not only put up physical barriers, but they also produce far less pollen and nectar. Plant natives, natives in many research are shown to be favored by native bees. Feed hummingbirds with plants. I show lots of colorful candidates. And use hummingbird feeders because they've been proven to be useful even during uh, summer with lots of flowers and certainly critical to, this, to the overwintering of Anna's hummingbird in our state. Plant a butterfly host plant. There is a publication that gives you lots of ideas for host plants and nectar plants for, humming, uh, for butterflies that come into Oregon. So there you have many choices. And plant a shrub because so many shrubs do triple, quadruple duty is in serving hummingbirds, bees, moth and butterfly, host plant. And finally plant a tree because trees provide long-term benefits that can be immense and certainly their benefits can go beyond pollinators uh, to include many other forms of wildlife. So moving on to my second objective, 
And that is that you will know how to use and adjust these OSU garden design resources to suit your space and your interest. So there are four designs. I'm beginning with one that's uh, for Central and Southern Oregon. And there are three that will follow and specific to Western Oregon habitats. Now, Sydney Dandler with um, OSU Garden Ecology Lab did these designs. She is a professional garden designer with expertise in ecological designs. And um, all four designs follow the same theme as is shown in this one. So let's review them. So first of all, they are 60 by 25 feet. In each design, there is a dry end and a wet end to account for different types of soil. In the center, there is a rocky habitat set aside for ground nesting bees. And you'll notice the tall plants are to the north and the shorter plants are to the south. And uh, the designs are a mixture of tree, shrub, perennial, annual bulbs. For west of the Cascade, there are three um, options. This one uses only native plants and uh, everything else is the same in terms of the size, the dry end versus the wet end, the tall plants in the north and shorter plants in the south, and the ground nesting bee habitat in the, in the middle. And one thing I want to mention is the drawing of these plants, especially the trees and shrubs, approximate the mature size of um, the plant. And I find that very useful. And you can see the scale, which right away tells you, you know, how much space would be appropriate to dedicate to a, a certain plant. So this design is using native plants and non-native plants, but also for west of the Cascades. If at this point you're thinking, there are so many plants, this, uh, each design, this is looking a little um, overwhelming. Uh, consider the, using these shortcuts. If you're looking to add, say a tree or a shrub, something that's bigger in size because you have the room for it, I would just focus on the upper half of these designs. And, uh, similarly, if you have limited space and you want something that's shorter, I would just focus on the lower half of the design. And if your soil uh, and your microclimate tends to be drier and sunnier, I would just look at the left half of each design. And um, if you have a wetter setting, you know, regularly irrigated, then focus on the right half. There's also a low maintenance option for West of the Cascades. And uh, this basically means that the plants used in the design tend to need less work to maintain properly and for them to do well. The one thing you might have noticed is all these color renderings, whether it's for Southern and Central Oregon, or native plants, or this low maintenance garden, they are really colorful. And I hardly ever remember seeing a garden that looks this colorful. And of course, that's because this is a composite color combination of spring through fall. So if you zero in on a particular design and you want to look at details of you know, how does it look in early spring? Or how does it look in late summer? You can find the color renderings done for each season. 
This is the low maintenance garden in early spring. Much less colorful. Okay, that's more realistic. But late spring into summer, May through September, it's likely to look like this. And then it's going to morph into this look late summer through fall. So when you go to the website to download the publication, look for something that's called supplemental, um, supplemental files, I think. And um, anyway, it's on that page. And that's the link that will get you to these per season color rendering. And for each design, they give you quite a bit of information. To begin with, comma name and scientific name, and they're grouped by the bloom season. So early spring, late spring into summer, and late summer into fall. And then for each plant, they tell you the pollinator attraction right here, which pollinator does it attract or serve? They also tell you the watering needs, dry some water moist soil, the sunshade requirement. And I really like this last part, the bloom, color, and month. Pretty helpful information, all put in one place. I mentioned earlier, these designs are done by a professional garden designer. And so she has taken into consideration potentially where the garden could be, the garden conditions. And she also made it easy for us to act on our preferences. Which pollinator do we want to focus on? What season do we want to highlight? Whether we prefer native or non-native plants? And um, the maintenance needs that we would like to um, deal with in our gardens. I think this is a really invaluable resource and I hope you will give it a try. I had mentioned earlier that um, the plants specify for one design or one geographic area could be potentially used for another area. And obviously, if you do that, then you want to take into consideration how winter hardy that plant is and how heat tolerant that plant might be. And just looking at the USDA hardiness zone map, obviously the valley is warmer in the, in the winter, we tend to be in zone eight compared to central Oregon, which tends to be in zone five or six. And uh, the hardiness zone is a measurement of the minimum winter temperature over decades and um, an average of that. And uh, with the increasing heat during the summer, something else we wanna think about is the heat tolerance of plants. And clearly in this instance, Southern Oregon and parts of Central Oregon is likely to have higher high temperature for more days during the summer compared to the valley. And the heat zone, in case you uh, are not familiar, is set by measuring the number of days where the high temperature exceeds 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So take these two things into consideration, winter hardiness and heat tolerance. You can switch plants around the different designs, but just be sure to do a little research. And something else that I find useful is to know the general characteristics of flowers that are preferred by each group of pollinator because who wants to carry a plant list when you go plant shopping? You just wanna act on impulse, uh, certainly I do. So we know a lot about what bees like and I'll talk about that Next, but for butterflies, for example, they can see color and they like some strong colors, 
But in general, they need the flower to have a very wide landing pad, which will support them while they're feeding. While birds also can see all the colors humans can see, in addition, they can see ultraviolet. But to support birds feeding, they need strong enough perch to support them. So if you know the general characteristics, that can help you in finding the plants that are likely to work. Now let's take a look at what bees like in flowers, um, both by color and shape. I'm not going to go into details, but all of these are good bee flowers for different reasons. And it took decades of research for Gordon Frankie, who's the author of this book, California Bees and Blooms, to figure that out. And his work has uh, led to a book. I read the book and produced a five minute video, which basically gives you the highlight of his findings of the color and shape of flowers. And if you check out this five minute video, there is a plant list to go with it. That will save you from reading a book, but you're certainly encouraged to read it because it has a lot of great information. So now I'm going on, uh, moving on to my final objective. And that is, I hope you will answer the call to action to make our gardens more sustainable. Because after all, if we want to add plants to make our garden more attractive to pollinators, wouldn't we also want to be able to sustain these efforts and make gardening easier and more enjoyable for us? So this is my first one, plant and grow. I know gardeners already are planting and growing, but a couple of things to remind us is that we should aim to grow year round and we should aim to grow a variety of plants because that combination will give us the best bang in making our soil healthier. And here's why. Let's take a look at the upper right corner. That photo shows plant root releasing something called root exudates. And root exudates are, think of it as sort of sugar water. And the sugar is carbon fixed through photosynthesis. So the plants make food through photosynthesis and they give out some of that food through their roots. And the food that comes out of the roots attract microbes to live in the adjacent areas and feeding off of this free food. We also know through research that the different kinds of plants produce, uh, use different formula for their exudates and, um, and different microbes are attracted to different kinds of exudates. So the long story leading to the short conclusion is here. A diversity of plants will diversify soil microbes. If we want healthy soil, we want a rich, diverse community of soil microorganisms. And the way to do that is by growing a variety of plants. Now, you might have seen this image of different kinds of plants having different root profile. And uh, yes, that's true. And that's one of the benefit of growing a diverse plant community. But what's even better is think about each root sending out different kinds of food, cultivating a different kind of soil microbe community. And when we have diversity above, how wonderful would that be in the soil community? If you have time, look up Ray Archuleta, who is a soil scientist with the uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service. 
it's like the national branch, national entity uh, equivalent to kind of the local soil water conservation people. He has many videos on YouTube and uh, I learned so much about soil from him. The second one is take care of our soil. And these are three things that we all should strive to practice. The first one is don't disturb unless if it's necessary. Number two, keep it cover. And number three, feed it right. Let me talk a little more about each one. So this picture on the right is a photo of healthy soil. Healthy soil should look chunky. It should be, it should have lots of space in between. And when we disturb soil by digging, tilling, walking on it, um, we are breaking up the soil structure and the soil microbes that are responsible for giving us the structure have to go back and redo that work. So minimize the disturbance as much as possible. And we also know tilling and digging expose weed seeds. So that leads to more work for us to, to do. Now, keep it covered. I like the idea of green mulch. Plant densely, leave very little room for weeds uh, to reach light. So that's one strategy that we talked about earlier, grow a variety, grow year, year long as much as possible. But if you have bare soil, you want to keep it covered with mulch. And the best kind of mulch is arborous wood chip, this coarse wood chip. I know it does not look pretty to most people's eyes, but take the time to look at this video it's a talk by Dr. Linda Trocker Scott, and it shares researched information on different kinds of mulch material and their effect on the soil. Finally, feed it right. We often get questions by folks, what is the difference between organic and synthetic fertilizers? Well, this is the answer. Organic fertilizers rely on the soil microbes to break down before they can be used by plants. So organic fertilizers feed the soil microbes and the plants. Synthetic fertilizers are immediate, immediately available to plants, so they feed the plants only. So do you want to feed plants only, or would you want to feed soil and plants? And if you use organics, and remember the microbes are active or most active when the soil is warm and not so active when it's cold. And that is the reason why you always hear, if you use organic fertilizer, put it into the soil earlier, give it time. So lots of choices. And you can also supplement with something that's immediately available like um, fish fertilizer, dilute it and add it to your soil if you're, uh, when you wait for the organics to come into play. So the next call for action is slow flow and hold water. And this has to do with building or increasing the water holding capacity of our soil. If we treat our soil well, and there is a rich soil microbe community, that is going to improve the water holding capacity. But in our gardens, if we look for places where the natural slope will allow us to slow the water flow through our property and or even possibly capture water on site, that is a good thing. And of course, the traditional ideas are using rain garden, permeable paver, bioswale, all sorts of other uh, tools that will take some design and work. And if you're interested in this topic, 
A short handout, this is a one-page handout from OSU Extension, is worth looking at for some ideas. Number four, create habitat. We've spent so much time talking about providing food through flowers for pollinators. And of course, they also need shelter and they need water, which is something we sometimes don't think about. So for bees, we know we have to give them water in a shallow dish and use rocks or marbles in it so they don't drown. And for butterflies, we know they not only need moisture, but they also need minerals. And um, in nature, you might have seen butterflies sucking on moist mud or even fresh manure, because those are sources in nature where they can get minerals or salts. And, um, and so if we want to benefit butterflies in the middle of summer, we can use shallow dishes packed with sand, saturated and mixed in a little bit of composted manure. And that can be a source for minerals to uh, feed butterflies that visit. And of course, for birds, we know they like clean moving water. And my final point is adopt integrated pest management. This is a very simple idea. Basically, don't take action until we know really what the problem is. And with a range of options are available, choose the least harmful solution. And finally, it will be tremendous if all of us can increase our personal tolerance for imperfection. I know I, I'm accepting holes in leaves. I am more willing to prune off disease parts of plants or washing off uh, with jets of flowers, pests, or simply just get rid of a plant and replace it with something that's more resilient or is not going to be affected by the same problem. And if you do choose to use pesticides, keep in mind broad spectrum is something that you don't want to choose lightly. It's much better if you use something that will target specific insect or pathogen that is the problem. And I encourage everyone to consider growing beneficial plants, the plants that will attract predatory insects into our gardens so we can have troops and troops and armies of uh, pollinators and a variety of insects to work on our behalf in the garden. And by now, if you're still awake, and you're still ready to look at uh, more ideas just for fun. Here are a number of resources. The first one, we're in uh, the OSU Garden Col uh, Ecology Lab, is the place where lots of research is done and they write short blocks to tell you research underway. And uh, another one I want to highlight is pollination. And that is uh, something out of Oregon State. And they do these podcasts, usually about half an hour, with uh, researchers on a variety of topics generally related to bees or some kind of bees and very interesting. And of course, don't forget Xerces Society, which is a nonprofit organization that focuses on invertebrate conservation. And they're very heavily involved in the Western monarch butterfly population um, effort. And they also do a lot of information, uh, a lot of work on bees. So with that, let's see if we have some questions. Hi, Sherry. Your presentation was so complete that we just had very few questions. One is, should we, when we're trying to design a pollinator garden, should we include water in with that design for the pollinators? I think it's important to include water. The reason is because if we make our offering more complete, so not only nectar plants and plants that offer pollen, but also have water, 
we're more likely to keep the pollinators longer in our garden. And for me, that is a benefit because I like watching them in the garden. And as I mentioned earlier, depending on who you want to serve, bees like shallow water because boy, they can drown easily. So you wanna give them shallow dish. You wanna make sure that you have marbles, uh, pebbles in it. Uh, so they have a perch and they're not gonna fall in. And that's the same with butterfly. They just need a moist surface. They don't need puddles of water. Uh, and it's good to have some minerals in it. But for birds, they can use water and they like running water. Okay, great. Um, this person would like to know if a Western red bud will grow in zone 8B in partial shade. Western red buds are uh, hardy enough for zone 8, definitely. Okay. And part shade will be okay because these are, and if you put it in a environment where the part shade comes from deciduous trees, mm -hmm. that's even better because depending on where the overhead canopy actually fully leaf out, that you may give your tree the opportunity to get some sunlight and develop and leaf out before the canopy is fully developed. Okay. Now, and I showed a picture of the Western red bud that has the really pretty flowers. Right. And uh, they flower very early and they're really stunning. And do they flower before they leaf out? Also? Yes, they do. Yeah. 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 So that's, yeah. that's even better to have a deciduous tree beside it. Okay. Yeah. Um, this person said, you, you talked about the globe, Gilia, Gila? Yeah, globe, Gilia. Gilia. Yeah. yeah the, she said it looked like it had quite complex petal structure. And you were talking about less petals is better. So she wanted to know, since this is a native, is that going to matter for the pollinators? Actually, the globe gilia, if you look at the flower closely, it is a globe shape with many individual uh, kind of flower clustered together. Okay. So when you, uh, and that's the same thing with the allium, you know, like the onion flowers, mm -hmm. you know, that they're, they're kind of a, lots of individuals cluster together. So the important thing is that the part is a easily accessible flower for bees, even though it's all clustered together. And I think the shape is making the foraging for nectar and pollen so much easier. And that's one of the reasons why it's attractive. In addition, it's a blue color flower. So that's one of the colors bees like. Okay, um, and this person lives in the Klamath Basin and they wanna know how to find out what kind of milkweed to plant for the monarchs. Oh, uh, um, I, I showed, you know, I can't remember the species. It's not Cordifolia, uh, it's a different Asclepia. You know, just write an email to 10 Minute University 2017 at gmail.com. And I will respond with that specific species of milkweed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And. Um, but also, you know, actually, we're sending everybody a recording. And right. on the page, the, the monarch butterfly page, I did show the species. I just can't think of it. Okay. This moment. okay. And we just had a lot of people that were really thankful that the presentation was so good and so complete. And one person said it was so nice to know that less petals are better than more petals. That was something that she didn't realize. So that was all the questions we had, Sherry. That was so complete and so wonderful. So remember, if anybody wants to find some of these plants that Sherry talked about, please go to the Spring Garden Fair, April 30th and May 1st in Canby, where we're having our Clackamas County Master Gardener Spring Garden Fair. And please join us next Wednesday, the 27th. Cheryl Borden is giving a talk on gardening with children. So well, I, just, I, I just want to say a final word, and that is Earth Day is coming. And, um, you know, I think the condition of Earth now and how gardeners feel uh, as we think of ourselves as stewards of our garden and certainly a little tiny piece of earth that we see our job as um, something that's every day, not just one day a year. And that's why I put in the call for action in this presentation. 
it may sound a little heavy handed and, and, you know, but on the other hand, really, what are we gardening for? We're gardening not only for our own enjoyment, but also for future pop, uh, generations. And I think about my grandchildren and what kind of earth they're going to inherit and what our ecosystem will look like with the changing climate that everything is, you know, one day hail and the next day, you know, 70 degree temperature yeah. and sun. Um, you know, we all have to become more resilient and we have to help our gardens to become more resilient. And um, so thank you so much for sticking with our 10 minute university program. We just get so much joy talking with you and sharing ideas with you. And I hope certainly you will come to visit us at the Spring Garden Fair. Jane and I will be there the whole time and uh, we'll be answering gardening questions and doing other things. And so stop by and say hi, and we love to, we love to see you. Um, and yeah, and there are lots of plants to sell, for sale for sure. Okay, thank you. Sharon. Okay, thanks everybody.